Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'll just get my slides up and running. So there, there are the slides for you. So yes, as Jane said, and it says on the slide here, I'm the curator of art collections at the Science Museum in London. Um, hopefully a place that many of you know from visits in the past and hopefully many visits to come, but perhaps not a job title that you would associate with the museum. But in fact, art has been part of the Science Museum since its inception, whether that be in the permanent collection or more recently as part of the commissioning display and events programmes. And classically, one argument for why you might bring artists into these kinds of spaces uh, has long been either that the inclusion of new voices and new perspectives is something art can bring, or that um, art can question the assumptions and values of science. So these are, of course, both valid and important issues. But for me, the role of art in a science context and, of course, a medical context more specifically can be so much more than that. Uh, my background as a curator and an academic is jointly in the history of art and the history of science. So for me, our work with art needs to be rooted in an understanding of how art and science, artists and scientists have in fact always interacted and how this is expressed within the collections at the Science Museum. So in this lecture, I'm going to do three things, speaking to my title, and, and Jane has covered a little bit of this already, but Firstly, I'm going to give you some context and history of the Science Museum and its work with art to show how our current activity is part of a much longer dialogue within the museum itself. Secondly, I'm going to focus on a new set of galleries called Medicine, the Welcome Galleries, which opened to the public in November 2019 and which feature five new artist commissions alongside a, a huge range of visual and medical collections. So I'm going to talk in detail about each commission and I'm going to try really hard to bring the artist's voice in in how I talk about it and to give you a sense of their thoughts. And then alongside, I'm going to think about what those commissions tell us about broader dialogues between art and medicine. And then thirdly and lastly, I'm going to draw on these discussions to think about what art brings to this kind of science context. And if there is anything special about medicine and art within that, as opposed to the sciences more broadly. So. If we start with some history, when the Science Museum was formally created as a separate institution in 1909, it was founded with collections from what had been the South Kensington Museum and the Patent Museum, both of which formerly sat on the site of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this included artworks from a side project by the then curator of the Patent Museum, the brilliantly named Bennett Woodcroft. And his side project was a national gallery of portraits of inventors, discoverers and introducers of the useful arts. And here you're seeing four examples from that a gallery, which came into the museum as part of its founding collections. Now, artworks continued to join the collection from this point, largely selected, I should say, for their representational value. So for what they showed about science or medicine happening. Um, and they were housed within the relevant scientific or technological collections departments. So it was only with the formation of a designated pictorial collection in the 1970s, and you can see some examples from that in this installation shot from our galleries. It was with the formation of that collection that for the first time, the wealth of the image collections of the Science Museum could really be seen. And a huge amount of cataloguing and research was done by curator Wendy Sheridan, um, who also made a lot of additions to the collection up until 2005. Now, this work on the pictorial collection ran alongside the single largest addition to the Science Museum collections, which came in 1976 when the Welcome Collection was deposited with the museum on long term loan. And here are some examples of objects from the Welcome Collection on display in the new medicine galleries. Now, this added medicine to the museum's remit, which had recently previously only focused on science and technology. It doubled the object holdings of the museum, and it also notably added a, a more social and global dimension to the museum's interests, because Henry Wellcome, who had brought these objects together, was influenced by the what was then the emerging discipline of anthropology. And he amassed collections aiming to show the historical development of medicine as a cultural attribute across the world. In the 1990s, the museum developed a contemporary arts program and a policy which was instigated in 1996 that it would, to quote, integrate art within the development process for all major capital projects, both buildings and galleries. Now, this meant new contemporary art specifically, 
And the intention was that this would enable the public to explore science and technology through art, create innovative environments, allow artists to engage with the museum's collections and expertise, and particularly promote the exploration of new digital media. So from 1999 to 2014, under the leadership of Hannah Redler Hawes, a whole range of projects run by the Science Museum Arts Programme worked with contemporary artists to produce temporary and permanent gallery interventions, exhibitions, research, residencies and events. And these focused on bringing artistic perspectives to bear on the impacts and social context of science, often raising moral or ethical questions. And I'm showing you a shot here of a, a brilliant project um, that imagined um, visitors being given tours of the museum as if uh, humans have been wiped out and cockroaches are trying to understand humanity through through its collections. So there are clearly strong connections between the art and medicine collections throughout the remit of the museum. And if we look at just a handful of examples from the art collections to give you a flavour, we see the different ways in which the visual image has responded to and shaped our understanding of medicine. So whether that be uh, a set of First aid images on trade cards from 1913, sketches made by Barbara Hepworth observing surgery in 1948, just prior to the foundation of the NHS, early high speed photography by the French um, photographer Etienne Jules Marais, where he used this to understand the movement of the human body, historic religious sculpture like this statue of Mary Magdalene, which combines religious and medical iconography in a manner that we're going to come back to later in the talk, or more recent purchases like this portrait of Indian bone setter Mohammed Salim that was purchased for the medicine galleries. Um, so alongside this um, larger collection, the museum has also developed a programme of working directly with artists to develop exhibits for our galleries and exhibitions, as I mentioned, and many of these have focused on diverse and complex medical subjects. So I'm going to show you a, a couple of examples from our welcome win especially our gallery called Who Am I, which looks at medicine and identity. Um, and I should say that all of these artworks have, have also come into the collection out of, of this work for the galleries. So here's one example a series uh, from a series by Marlene Dumas uh, called The Experiment and the Expert, uh, Anthony Gormley's Iron Baby sculpture, and a piece by Yinka Shonibare called Effective Defective Creative. Now, these are all works that actively seek to court controversy to some extent or another, and they certainly aim to bring the viewer up short, stressing the vulnerability of our bodies and how they can be seen differently in different medical and social contexts. And I'm happy to talk more specifically about these works in the questions. And I should quite clearly say that these works sometimes upset our visitors. So we have to think carefully about the interpretive and display strategies that we use to embed them in such a way that they work to encourage reflection and dialogue rather than to shut it down through causing unintended harm. And I think art has a particular power in these kinds of science and medical contexts of which we need to be aware. Now, I arrived at the Science Museum in 2017 as essentially the third iteration of Art Curator following Wendy Sheridan and Hannah Redler, who I've mentioned. And as a new approach, as um, Jane mentioned, my remit combines the, collecting, uh, the collection with the commissioning programme, bringing together these different aspects above. My arrival coincided with the development of a suite of new galleries, now known as Medicine the Welcome Galleries, which were due to open in 2019. And they were intended to include a series of major contemporary art commissions. The galleries were, and are, the largest and most ambitious gallery project ever undertaken at the Science Museum. They cover the whole first floor of the museum, an area equivalent to 1,500 hospital beds, and they feature over 3,000 objects. And the galleries are divided, this is a floor plan of the museum, they're divided into five thematic spaces, which explore key aspects of medicine in our history and present, and they focus on a personal patient-centred perspective. So there are three narrative galleries and two spotlight galleries to, to give you a, a brief understanding of how these work. So Medicine and Bodies, which you can see on the left, is the first um, narrative gallery. And that considers how the search to understand more about the human body has transformed medicine over the last 500 years, from early anatomical explorations to studying the body under the microscope. Medicine and Treatments, which you can see further along um, on the top right, concentrates on individuals' experiences of surgery, therapies and drugs, 
from the perspectives of the people who develop, deliver and experience them. And medicine and communities, which you can see just below that, steps back to reveal the health challenges faced by groups, societies and whole populations, from epidemics to the provision of health services and infrastructure. Then, very visually and conceptually distinct from those three galleries, the two spotlight galleries are Exploring Medicine, which you can see towards the middle, and Faith, Hope and Fear, which you can see to the far right. And these focus on striking mass displays and a much lighter approach to interpretation, showcasing the diversity and sheer scale of the collection and tracing the many different ways that people have made sense of and managed their health over time and across cultures. Now, from my perspective, alongside the development of the galleries, we've sought to bring the museum's art collections and commissioning into closer conversation. Developed for permanent galleries with an intended lifespan of 25 years, the five new art commissions are therefore going to be part of the museum's approach to art for a generation and how our visitors experience art within the museum. So they're therefore important, as important in what they bring to the permanent record of art and science in dialogue within the collection, to the understanding of those disciplines, histo histories, imageries and structures, as they are to the narratives and visual experiences of the galleries themselves. The commissions sit alongside a wealth of visual material from the existing medical and art collections, which tells the long history of how we have visually understood the human body. And each work draws particularly on the narratives and needs of its gallery, while also, collect while also connecting to the broader collections. They connect into considerations of representation and imagery in how art and medicine, and of course science more broadly, engage with each other, as well as providing significant visual points in the space and attracting a different audience to the museum. So, mirroring the patient-centred approach of the galleries, we wanted to ensure that the artist's voice was, was strong for our visitors. So in the space, the artists share quotations on the object labels with their thoughts on the works, um, acting as a balance to the curatorial voice in the rest of the label. In a similar vein, I worked with three of the artists after the galleries had opened to develop an in-conversation article for our journal, where I asked them to reflect on what is special to them about creating work for a medicine gallery and a science museum. And in working with them on the commissions and in asking these questions, as the curator, I wanted to understand and articulate how these works can make viewers look at and think differently about histories of medicine, but also histories of art. So as I go through the commissions below, you're going to hear quotes from the artists alongside my thoughts that are all taken um, from those in conversation or mostly taken from those in conversations. So to start off. On entering the Medicine and Bodies Gallery, you immediately meet, meet Mark Quinn's self-conscious gene. Rick Ganest, who features in this sculpture by Mark Quinn, um, had a brain tumour in his early teens, which he survived. But as a response, he started to cover his body in tattoos, uh, mixing anatomical imagery and common tattoo iconography, such as spiders' webs, gravestones, insects and lettering on his knuckles. Ganesh therefore made of himself what we call an accroché figure, um, a term that's common to medicine and art, where the skin is removed to show the musculature of um, often a human body, but also um, sometimes animal anatomy as well. But he also made himself into a kind of decaying corpse with the classic art, art historical imagery of what we call the memento mori, something that reminds us of the fleeting nature of human life. And discussing his choice of Ganesh for this sculpture, Mark Quinn explained to me that literalising a quest to understand his own body, his tattoos are a kind of poetry, his being Ganesh. His ritual mirrors the human quest to understand and fix ourselves through medicine. Working with Rick felt like an intersection between the contemporary world, pop culture and an anatomical model. It seemed that these connections would be perfect as a basis for an artwork at the Science Museum. And he followed on. Through this sculpture, I wanted to explore the deep desire held by humans to understand their bodies and personal histories. In this work, Rick holds an encyclopedia of anatomy, and the tension between the book and the figure creates an almost contemplative atmosphere. Now, this book that he refers to, that Ganest is holding, is, as you can see on the left, um, called an anatomical dic dictionary. But on the pages of this, Quinn has reproduced two famous images from a seminal work by, Vers by Vesalius, published in 1543 and called On the Fabric of the Human Body. 
And this work offered the first comprehensive visual account of human anatomy. It was hugely significant for both medicine and art um, and incredibly striking visually, as you can see. And there's a copy of that displayed nearby to the sculpture in the Medicine and Bodies Gallery. So for Quinn, this sculpture acts to connect street culture, tattooing, pop, fashion into the museum and give visitors a way to see themselves in the displays. For me, it also connects the visual culture of tattooing, as well as the history of that practice, into art historical and medical imagery, connecting Vesalius to street culture. And we were lucky to work with the tattoo historian Matt Loder on detailed interpretation of the tattoos and for the piece. It also seems useful here to share some comments from Quinn on the physical choices made in making a bronze so large and so rich in imagery. So he told me, there's a lot of consideration needed when you're enlarging something to this scale. I made Rick's head bigger, so when the artwork is viewed from below, it still appears in proportion. So this kind of way of showing the human body, he's thinking about that in a 3D way, in a similar way to how someone like Vesalius and his artists were, were, were thinking about how to represent it. And um, Mark Quinn continued, normally in a sculpture, you would clean the connections and get rid of any marks of welding. But I decided against that for self-conscious gene. The purpose of this sculpture is to reflect how Rick was constantly culturally redesigning his biological body. So the sculpture itself should always look in a state of progression, not fully finished. Now, Ganesh sadly died during the making of the commission. So text on the anatomy book also records the sculpture as Quinn's monument to a unique individual. Throughout the same gallery, Medicine and Bodies, and like a visual spine down the Medicine and Treatments Gallery, you also see a second commission, a series of portrait photographs by Sean Davy. Now Davy has worked as a psychotherapist for many years before she turned to photography, and her work constantly engages with different mental landscapes and people that might be seen as outside of the normal in medicine or indeed society. So for the portraits in medicine and bodies, Davy worked with our participation group called When Medicine Defines What's Normal, to produce a series of portraits, both physical in the space and digital on kiosks, that show a range of sitters living with different medical conditions. Uh, the group helped to shape the choice of sitters, Sean's approach to pose and clothing, and the choice of background colours. And audio interviews with the sitters feature on the accompanying kiosks. And I'm showing you some examples of those here. For the Medicine and Treatments Gallery, Davy photographed a number of individuals already working with the museum around their experience of receiving or giving medical treatment. So she captured their personalities and built on her discussions around pose and representation with the participation group so that each sitter appears twice in the physical portrait. So um, back to back. So you can see them on either side of this, this white case um, in, the mid, mid, uh, in the middle. Excuse me. And they have differences of pose, pose and expression in each image helping to build a picture of a person who is more than one facet of a personality. Now, Davy was unfortunately unable to join the In Conversation um, that I mentioned, but she'd previously joined the museum in March 2019 for a conference that we held called Representing the Medical Body, at which she spoke compellingly about how we love and care for things that are different to us. Now, Davy's spoken a lot about how her turn to photography came originally from using the camera to understand her relationship with her daughter, Alice, who was born with Down syndrome. And Davy brought a lot of conference participants to tears with her thoughtful and deeply personal commentary on human vulnerability and how one person's diagnosis or lived experience is only a small part of society's relationship to difference. And she's also written about this project, so I wanted to bring her voice in here. And she's written... Previously, as a psychotherapist, I've listened to many stories, and it is interesting that what has been revealed to me is not how different we are to one another, but rather how alike we are as people. It's what we share that is significant. The stories vary, but we all experience similar emotions. We are all vulnerable to feelings of anger, grief, depression, and so on. Alice's story concerns all of us. My daughter's diagnosis is only one aspect of it. The rest is about yours and mine, and indeed society's relationship with difference of all kinds. So for Sean, the portraits for our galleries were part of this broader approach to understanding difference through photography. For us, her photographs helped to make people fundamentally visible in the galleries at life size, 
foregrounding people's stories and individual experiences. And you really feel in the galleries like they might step out of the frame. There might be a visitor who's through some kind of um, frame rather than, a, than an image. But they also crucially help us to think about portraiture in our collection, contributing to diversifying the emphasis in many of our historical portraits on British men from the past. Moving on to the Medicine and Communities Gallery, the ceiling of the gallery is taken over by Studio Rosso's Bloom. And here you're looking across and um, the galleries are around a central space and you're looking across the gallery and you can see Bloom um, hanging from the ceiling um, at the top. Now, so this is a vast kinetic sculpture which evokes the spread of epidemic and pandemic disease, helping to give a sense of the scale at which health and medicine operates at a group rather than an individual level. So compared to the previous two um, commissions that we've discussed, there are no people here, no faces. Rather, the sculpture evokes a large diagram in a textbook or scientific paper, where each branching structure ends in a series of propellers. So the propellers spin, light up and change colour in a series of different imagined narratives that evoke how diseases might spread in a community. Each propeller might be a person or a city. Diseases spread slowly or with alarming speed. Some colours are vibrant and slowly fade as a subject recovers or might stop as the, result, uh, the disease results in someone's death. It's a really mesmerising piece and it draws the eye from the gallery below as well as many points in the medicine galleries themselves. And of course, we couldn't have foreseen how much more poignant and deeply relevant the sculpture would become with the outbreak of COVID-19 uh, last year when we installed it the year before. Now, Studio Rosso, um, which is a design studio made up of, of two people, Sophie Nielsen and Rolf Knudsen, they're interested in how the title Bloom makes connections between beauty and disease. So flowers bloom, but so do rushes or moulds. Speaking to me for the In Conversation, they told me that being visual people, we were intrigued by the diagrams and maps of disease transmission, uh, disease transmission networks and epidemiological diagrams that experts use to predict the paths that epidemics will follow across the globe so that they can cut them off before they get out of control. These networks are an important part of epidemiological studies and are also visually very beautiful. And they continued. He created a three dimensional diagram showing air represented by propellers turning as the carrier and active part in an epidemic system. We also made the propellers light up when a virus spreads throughout the diagram. When a virus is present in the body on a microscopic level, it is the most colorful and embellished of microbes. As a result, the whole structure of bloom becomes more and more colorful when a virus is present. So there's something interesting here as well about how we see something like a virus at a microscopic level um, and then how we think about that when we visualise it. And Bloom was also a design and engineering challenge uh, to produce this kind of experience. So it's worth thinking about the production of this as well as the imagery. As Studio Rosso told me, when creating a piece of this scale, we never actually get to see it in its, in, in its entirety. So we decided to use VR to be able to see and feel it in the actual space. This way we could see the piece in situ and walk around the museum to get a sense of its visual presence from different locations, like from the ground floor, gal floor galleries looking up or looking across from the opposite gallery. We could place ourselves underneath it to test different disease spread stories in the most realistic way. So it, there's a lot of different quite high tech technology um, coming into the creation of this piece. So for me, the piece makes crucial connections for us in two ways. It speaks interestingly to histories of diagram in how scientific ideas have been communicated. And the branching tree structure that it uses is common in so many visual um, scientific histories in thinking about how we classi classify and categorise knowledge. And um, the most famous being in how in one of Darwin's diagrams from The Origin of Species. And I hope that it encourages visitors to engage with these kinds of diagrams differently especially after we've become so much more used to seeing this kind of visualisation through um, the period of COVID-19. But the physical te technicalities of the piece also make relationships with other kinetic commissions throughout the museum, from our Wonder Lab to the Welcome Wing, and some of which date to pioneering computer art of the early 2000s. Now, from both balcony galleries, you see Eleanor Crook's commission, Santa Medicina, beckoning you into the final gallery, Faith, Hope and Fear. And Crook's beautiful bronze figure, Santa Medicina, is designed to be both a surgeon and saint. 
offering an imagined patron saint of medicine that combines faith with treatment. So Crook deftly weaves iconographies from religion and medicine together. The stethoscope that the figure wears becomes a rosary, the surgeon's mirror a monstrance, the dress opens down the back like hospital scrubs to reveal the kind of accroché muscle that I already mentioned in relationship to Quinn's piece is covered in amulets, connecting to objects and themes elsewhere in the gallery. And there's a really nice participatory element to this as well, because Crook asked people involved in the project to, to suggest an amulet from their own medical experience. And I think that my teenage self would be particularly delighted that my years of hated orthodontic treatment were represented by um, a retainer brace, which Crook somehow managed to make beautiful. But other aspects include um, a severed thumb in recognition of a man from the foundry who helped Crook produce the piece who nearly lost his thumb in that process, but I'm glad to say um, was, was healed. Now, the sculpture really draws you in. So the wax figure that is sheltered within Santa Medicina's skirts raises a lot of questions and emotional responses, encouraging you to think about death. And that's the brief that we gave um, Crook to respond to, to create a space to think and talk about death. And I've seen visitors discussing the amulets and their meaning, really engaging with the piece in a tactile, personal way. And the ability to touch artworks was something that we felt that this sculpture and Quinn's sculpture could really bring to the galleries, a different kind of um, interaction because touch is so crucial to, to medical experience as well. And Crook explained to me in our in conversation where the idea from the, for the piece came. She said, the thing that really informed the work was a very young childhood memory of a set of sculptures that introduced me to the idea of death. These are the bronze sculptures at the cenotaph of Maximilian I at the Hofkirche in Innsbruck. There are 28 tall black bronze spectacular kings and queens surrounding the empty tomb, with extraordinary texture in their clothes, jewellery and armour. It was something of that still highly decorative, sombre atmosphere that I wanted to imbue into this statue because it recalled to me this first presentiment of mortality that I'd been given through a sculptural experience as a child. And Santa Medicina responds very strongly to the rich religious objects and iconography that are particularly found in the welcome collections at the museum, but aren't very common in the art collections. Crook explains a detail which I feel particularly brings histories of art and medicine together. The eyes are hand-blown, human-grade prosthetic eyes, which went in very late in the process. I was reminded that the sculptors in ancient Egypt used to have an opening of the eye ceremony where they painted the eyes on the statue, and that is when the spirit of the god was said to enter. The piece therefore also speaks to important material histories of how artists and scientists have worked with brass and wax throughout history. And Crook speaks beautifully about her experience of materials as an artist. She told me, compared to the bronze, which is hugely complicated and labour intensive, making a wax model returns to the first principles of sculpture. You take this very biddable material in your hands, start with nothing, and with a little bit of patience and imagination, you coalesce a human being out of the ether. It is an interesting challenge to see how many emotions you can chase across one particular sculpture of a human face. Um, and I think that's a really um, extraordinary image that she conjures there. Now, at the other end of the Faith, Hope and Fear Gallery, a further commission was installed a year after the galleries opened in November 2020. Um, of course, not the first year that we expected. They were closed for a reasonable amount of it due to the pandemic, but a milestone worth marking nonetheless. Jenny Holtz's For Science takes the tactile engagement offered by Quinn and Crook's pieces a step further by providing a sculptural space where visitors can rest and reflect. The piece is comprised of two stone benches, as you see here, which use silver cloud granite inscribed with carefully chosen texts. The stone was chosen to evoke monuments and memorials, encouraging visitors to think about the role of that kind of sculpture in our everyday lives. Situated alongside a range of sculptures from across the globe that speak to religion, illness and ideas of death. And you can just see those in the, in the case in the centre beyond the benches. And that includes, for instance, the, the Mary Magdalene sculpture that I showed you at the beginning. And the Holtz's contemporary response brings a new dimension to this sculptural dialogue. Uh, Holtz had chose text in consultation with the museum team. 
um, and very much wanted to demonstrate the lived medical experience of two diverse contemporary writers, in this case, who experienced living with cancer. And this builds on her ongoing practice of extracting key ideas from writers, which her work then represents to the public. Um, and she's particularly well known for, for putting texts in different kinds of contexts. So the first piece features a text from Susan Sontag's Illness as Metaphor, which was published in 1978. And it actively engages with the idea that medicine and illness are shaped by our social context, with the phrase, illness is the night side of life. So Sontag introduces the idea that we have citizenship of two countries throughout our lives, the realms of the well and the sick, and that our residence in one or the other profoundly affects how both we and society perceive our lives and our bodies. And her work highlighted how the language we use to describe disease can result in stereotyping and stigmatisation of patients. The second bench features a text from Paul Kalanithi's When Breath Becomes Air, published in 2016, um, which was published shortly after his death from lung cancer, a diagnosis that tr transformed his pers perspective from doctor to patient and led him to reflect on the ethical decisions that were at the heart of his work. So the quote, what kind of life exists without language, refers to the significance of language for meaning in human relationships. Kalanithi studied English and philosophy before pursuing his medical career, which was particularly in neuroscience. Um, and he recognised the importance of both disciplines to his chosen field. He observed in the, work, in the, the book how medical professionals need language in order to negotiate knotty issues of benefit versus risk with their patients and reach agreements about the best course of treatment or not together. Holzer has described these authors thinking about illness as expansive and frank. Visitors are invited to sit on the benches and reflect, enjoying the haptic experience of the smooth granite compared to the sandblasted text. For Holzer, when words are carved in stone, they can be touched, they can be read with the hand, they might be perceived differently than when on the page. For us, these works significantly enhance and expand the museum's sculpture collections, which previously largely focus on busts of and by British male figures. By adding a conceptual, female and constructively critical contemporary voice, Holzer opens a dialogue from sculpture into both timeless and very current lived experiences. She shows how powerfully art can speak to scientific topics. So, to begin to conclude, in speaking to these artists as they reflected on the works over the course of 2020, I wanted especially to ask them whether they think it is a particular challenge to work with a medical context. Is that different to working with a scientific context more broadly? And I wanted to share their answers with you. So Studio Rosso said, maybe the biggest challenge was to turn complicated facts and content into tangible art. The way we approach big subjects is often to try and create a story or an analogy that can, we can use to turn something otherwise intangible into a physical object or representation. In this particular case, working with ideas and content that a lot of people do not want to be confronted with and turn it into an artwork that would not make our audience uncomfortable, but instead spark their curiosity and ultimately be understood across a wide audience without previous knowledge of the science of epidemics. Although, of course, many of us understand epidemics much more now than anticipated. Eleanor Crook commented, I think it's easier to connect with an audience on medical tomic topics than it is on, say, physics or entomology. Everyone has a body and a lively or morbid interest in its vulnerabilities. I think it goes straight to people's deep feelings as soon as you start talking about medicine. It provides a rich ground for making art. But addressing this topic also feels like a responsibility. I feel very sensitive when I'm working with people in the medical profession with a very specialist range of knowledge, which is beyond anything that a lay person could know. It has to live up to something important and complicated. And Mark Quinn answered that my work is about what it means to be human. A key difference I see in my work is that science and medicine are looking for answers while art is asking questions for their own sake. So. These ideas of responsibility, of comfort, of curiosity and of humanity perhaps do mark medicine out as different, connected as it is so strongly to the human body that we each experience. 
Yet the, these ideas also serve to remind us that wider science sits within culture and how we experience it. For me, it's crucial that these artworks contribute to making visible the historical dialogues embedded in what the museum has collected, as well as how and why. So the story that we tell in the museum. Art helps to prompt discussions about how knowledge and museum objects sit within wider networks of social understanding, with society shaping science as much as the creative arts. By unpicking the structures and image systems that give these kind of artworks their richness, I hope that visitors will be empowered to question the structures, structures and prejudices that similarly lie behind the medical word or image. <laughs>